This is Dr. Carrie Horn, author of A Soul Aligned, How God Heals His Creations, and Heart Known Series Workbook, a practical application workbook for biblical healing. In this video, I'm going to be discussing the topic and the question of whether or not trauma causes illness. So this is an interesting question for me to be revisiting. And of course, now I have... I understand where my illness was coming from, but there was always a part of me that knew that there had something to do with the trauma that I had experienced had something to do with my illness. And if you have listened to my story on the channel or you've read A Soul Aligned and read the first chapter, uh, then you know that there was quite a bit of childhood trauma that I endured And so it was really oftentimes usually something that I disclosed to the practitioners that I worked with, although they never really asked me. That was never part of the screening process, even though we know that, or even though they supposedly talk about a mind-body connection, right? And to be honest, my experience in both having worked in the medical community as well as the, uh, the field of mental health People who have endured emotional trauma and people who do who have, you know, sort of ambiguous diagnoses, like they don't fit in a box, they tend to be pathologized and dismissed. And that usually happens when the sciences can't put something in a box or they can't put a label on it or they don't feel like they're able to figure it out, so to speak, which you know, that's kind of a mixed bag for me because I don't believe that they've figured anything out (laughs) because they don't have the full picture. Um, But if they can't figure it out, then it's really sad the way that they treat people who have had, are already coming to them in a wounded emotional state. They are just not taken seriously. They're considered to be a nuisance. They're often fired as patients and just treated really poorly. And that treatment combined with feelings of desperation and often being drained financially while practitioners throw stuff against the wall and keep charging them for it, that leads to people acting a little crazy. Because when you're in that state, when you're being treated that way and you're desperate and you know that you're dying and you're helpless, you're going to start acting a little loony. You're not going to be the most fun person to be around. But let's look at it from the other side. If a practitioner doesn't know what's going on with you and they don't have the expertise or the understanding, they shouldn't be trying to treat you in the first place. And unfortunately, what happens is if they see that you have money, they'll keep treating you until that money runs out. If they see that you have good insurance, and we see this in the hospitals, they'll keep you longer. Your stay in a hospital is not contingent on whether you need to be in the hospital. It's contingent on your insurance. I can attest to it because I've watched it. I've seen it happen and I've reported it. And the governing agencies don't do anything about that either. So this is just a little tiny glimpse of what people who are dealing with chronic illness often experience. I've also heard people talk, you know, in groups that I've done with people who have chronic illness and even those who have a quote unquote firm diagnosis, right? Like people who have multiple sclerosis, that's considered a firm diagnosis. But even with people who've had, who have a firm diagnosis, oftentimes their family members, their, the people around them don't take them seriously. They think that they're feigning their symptoms. They're making it up. They're not really sick. And of course, if they come from a family where there's trauma, which most of them, if not all of them do, everyone I've ever talked with who has multiple, who had, has or has had multiple sclerosis and chronic illness came from trauma and has not resolved their trauma. So that was one of the things that I realized along the way as I was trying to figure things out for myself sitting in rooms with a bunch of usually women who were getting IVs and had various undiagnosed ambiguous issues, but definitely their symptoms were real. And undoubtedly they were being discounted and dismissed as having 
some sort of disorder that was made up in their mind. They call it psychosomatic. And behind your back, they call you crazy. Or they say psychosomatic and then they roll their eyes. It's implied. Now, you can have all kinds of issues that are that science has observed are ambiguous in terms of diagnostic category, ranging from neurological issues to chronic fatigue, so-called mental health issues. It can run a, an entire gamut of so-called disorders. So there's no doubt that science has been able to observe that people who have experienced emotional trauma, particularly childhood trauma, that there is a higher occurrence of illness. The problem is science does not know how to treat it. Science does not have understanding because they don't look at the entire picture. They deny the creator. They deny what he has told us about our condition. So let me tell you what science has observed. So obviously, we all know that for those who have experienced trauma, emotional trauma, or other traumas, that they have a higher occurrence of post-traumatic stress disorder. We know that it affects the body in terms of stress and fear. That's just a given, isn't it? We all know that, that it, it increases fear response in the body, and so you're going to have more PTSD diagnoses, anxiety, panic, phobia, these sorts of things. So I want to show you how to take a look at what is being observed, because that's all good. We can look at what's being observed, what's observable. God tells us to do that. He had people being brought to the priest at the temple to be observed when they had a rash or something going on. But the remedy was always the same. The remedy was always go into isolation for seven days and return to God. That's what you're doing in isolation for seven days. And so the only reason the priest was looking at the symptoms was to be able to identify if you had made any changes as a result of going into isolation for seven days. Did you genuinely return to God? By the way, this was established by God. This was not established by man. This is what God said. This is what you are to do. So God being the creator knows what he's doing. So let's go ahead and use God's language instead of using the world's language. And then we're going to have understanding. So the world says this is an anxiety disorder, PTSD, trauma, um, stress. Okay, so that's the language that they're using. So we're going to look at the research that's been done on stress. And we're going to look at what the research says because the re research always likes to make causal relationships, right? Like if this happens, then it causes that to happen. And that may in fact be so. It may be that when this happens, it causes that to happen. Doesn't mean that there is an underlying cause under that cause. For example... When Christ cast out the spirit from the little boy that was having seizures, you could have seen that when this happened, when the boy becomes stressed out, he has a seizure, for example. That's not an uncommon thing. When people who have so-called seizure disorders get stressed out, something happens. Or anyone who has chronic illness, when stress increases, their symptoms are going to increase, right? Right? Now let's use God's language. When fear increases, their symptoms are going to increase. But when the spirit was cast out of that boy, it wasn't happening anymore. So was it whatever the diagnosis would have been that says, oh, there's something going on in the brain that's causing this? Or was it the spirit that was causing whatever was going on in the brain? Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see how... When science is only looking at that which is observable and measurable, we don't have the full picture. We lack understanding. And so there's the treatments that they implement never actually do anything. At best, they're managing symptoms, but that cause, the thing that's underlying is still wreaking havoc on that person. And now you're taking poisons that are creating other issues that medicine calls side effects. Like, no big deal, it's just a side effect. 
Well, side effect is a big deal. In fact, there are quite a few side effects that are a bigger deal than the original problem. We know that. We make jokes about it, right? We take a pill for a headache and the commercials tell us that it uh, causes in, this medication causes internal bleeding and walking backwards and whatever else. So we're going to use God's language and we're going to take, take a look at what has been observed because that's all they can do. Fear, chronic fear, overwhelms the body's production of glucose contributing to the syndrome of type 2 diabetes. Increases stress hormone, which is slow to exit the body. Increases stomach acid, spasms, disrupts food motility, digestion, absorption, causing ulcers, bowel disorders, diarrhea, constipation, nausea, vomiting, gas production, malnutrition, and stomach pain. Weakens the intestinal barrier, allowing gut bacteria to enter the body, causing chronic inflammation and illness. All this propaganda, right, within medicine about drink bone broth and strengthen your gut gut wall. All of these minutia kind of solutions to the problem. And really this is being caused by a spirit of fear, isn't it? It's that spirit of fear is wreaking havoc on the body because it's able to do that. In males, lowered testosterone production, sex drive, libido, and causes erectile dysfunction or impotence. In females, causes absent, irregular, heavier, and painful menstruation, magnified symptoms of menopause, decreased libido and sexual desire, prohibits conception, impacts the health of pregnancy and postpartum adjustment, is transmitted to an unborn fetus and affects the development of the attachment between the mother and infant. Chronic tension and guardedness, triggering other parts of the body to react and promote other stress disorders such as tension, headaches, and migraines. Induces respiratory symptoms such as shortness of breath due to airway constriction between the nose and lungs. In people with respiratory diseases, stress can exacerbate breathing issues such as asthma attacks. Moreover, rapid breathing caused by stress can induce panic attacks in those with a particular proclivity towards syndromes of anxiety and or panic. Prolonged states of increased heart rate elevate stress hormones and blood pressure can increase the risk for chronic hypertension heart attack or stroke, weakens the immune system and increases the recovery time from illness, a heightened baseline of central nervous system arousal and modulation malfunction. For example, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for calming the body back down, becomes overactive and over time, it's unable to calm the body. So fundamentally incapable of doing the very thing that it's intended to do to calm the body. That just becomes your new baseline. But let me tell you something. I was experiencing stuff like this. I was waking up in the middle of the night. They thought I was going through like early menopause and I would just have these like what the world would call panic attacks. I wouldn't be able to catch my breath. My breathing was constricted. I had to put a pillow behind my back, you know, just to open up my airways and try to breathe. It was extremely distressing. I had cortisol tests, right? These spit tests that you do, they take your saliva and they check your cortisol throughout the day. My cortisol was shooting through the roof and then it would dip down. And I don't know if you know anything about this, but it's actually pretty dangerous for your cortisol to dip. We think of high cortisol as being a problem. Low cortisol is also extremely dangerous. So could they see that this was happening? Yeah, they could see. They could measurably observe that my cortisol was going through the roof and dipping down. Did anyone know why? Absolutely not. Could they have given me a treatment to cure it? Uh, No, not in seven years were they able to do that. And if my stress became so much or got to a certain point, I would start to feel tingling in my skin and then I would break out in welts. No one could tell me what those were. And then those welts within two days would turn into blisters. They would pop and I had open sores all over my body from head to toe that were itching but also completely raw. It was terrible. And no one could tell me what that was. Okay, let me just finish up this list here. So leads to autoimmune disorders, chronic pain and illness, and somatic issues, which again, right now I'm using the language of the world because this is coming from a soul aligned and I'm citing the source where I got this from. I'm citing the research. So that's why I'm using their language. But I want you to understand The cause of this, we already know the cause. God's already told us the cause. It is a spirit of fear. 
He didn't talk about syndromes. He didn't talk about anxiety disorders or trauma. Trauma is real. You know, the unresolved suffering is real. But we have to use the language that God has used or we're not going to understand the truth. We're going to think that there's like a side truth. And that's how we're treating things. And that side truth, by the way, that side truth in science, we actually treat God as the side truth. We've been treating him as an afterthought. And it's not because he didn't give us a manual. It's not because he didn't give us understanding or knowledge. It's because we chased after a different truth. All right. So prohibits the body from functioning properly, resulting in disease and death. Affects the frequency, quality, and quantity of food that we eat, contributing to heartburn or acid reflux. Heartburn pain can be increased by stress, even to the extent that spasms in the esophagus can be triggered and mistaken for heart attack. Fear can also impact difficulties with swallowing foods or even increase swallowed air that contributes to bloating and belching. Intensifies stomach discomfort such as pain, bloating, nausea, and vomiting. Fear can increase or decrease hunger. And unhealthy diets can worsen mood symptoms. Fear can also intensify ulcer symptoms. It also promotes constriction of the lung airways due to the tightening of smooth muscle, creating coughing, wheezing, and shortness of breath or exaggerated vasodilation and compromised blood circulation. I've talked, spoken with people who believed that they had and and were diagnosed with asthma. And then once this spirit of fear was out, they miraculously did not have this problem anymore. I can't tell you how many people I've worked with who were taking medications that were not working, by the way, were totally desperate, going through test after test, being on medications without the practitioner even knowing what the heck is going on with them. And once this was done, through a fast, through a fast and returning to God, once this spirit was out, done with medications, done with all of the lunacy of having to go through test after test after test, emptying their bank accounts to have no answers and to have no change in symptoms. They're still coming to me suffering and desperate. So you heard the symptoms and actually I'm a little surprised that they didn't even talk about neurological symptoms because we know that there are people who have so-called psychosomatic disorders and there are neurological issues that go along with their stress, fear. In my work with multiple sclerosis, people who were diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, they inevitably had unresolved trauma. And that is a so-called neurological issue is degeneration of the myelination in the brain. This is this sort of waxy substance that like that causes, you know, in an animal, you have a wider, what's called an axon. And so because it's wider, it's able to transmit signals faster. We don't have that. We have what's called a myelin sheath. And it's sort of this waxy substance that causes those, that transmission to go quickly from neuron to neuron. So what happens when that starts to degenerate? You don't have communication between neurons. That's kind of a serious thing, isn't it? And yet you have all of these people who have trauma and no one's talking about it. No one's talking about what's the connection there, what's going on there. And I gotta tell you, there is no treatment for anxiety. There's no legit treatment for anxiety. There's only management. And most of the time, it's not even managing it. The medications that they're giving you, the benzodiazepines and things like this, actually end up causing, and science knows this, rebound anxiety. Why does it cause rebound anxiety? Well, let's return to God's truth. If this is a spirit of fear and you're taking a medication that's breaking down the temple of God and you are engaging in the idolatry of some expert and some pill over returning to God, Do you think you're going to be handed over to the spirit you've chosen? And when you're handed over to that spirit, your condition is going to be worse than it was in the beginning. Okay, so let's talk about what is it that's causing all of this. It's very simple. We already know. Christ has told us what it is. It is a spirit of fear. Now, before I start talking about this, I want to say, if you haven't listened to my story, you may want to listen to my story so that you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I am not blaming people for being sick. I was on the brink of death. I was literally dying when the father drew me to the son. That's how up against the wall God had to take me. 
So I don't have a judgment on anyone, but I am going to speak the truth about what God has built in me, what he taught me in that experience, the reason why he sent that experience so that I could share it with others. So if anyone has a problem with it, I'm not going to be intimidated into not sharing this message. So if this message upsets you, don't bother wasting your time putting a comment that is rude and disrespectful because I'm just going to delete it. I don't really care about what anyone has to say that is going to conflict with the word. This is what the word teaches. God healed me when no one else could. God healed me when science and medicine and psychology could not even put a dent and actually made me worse. There is no reasonable explanation for that, that God increases his voice in me and then I'm healed. As he begins to minister to me about my sin, as he begins to teach me and tell me that I've been set apart for something, that is strictly biblical. Science is not. So if you read my story, you heard my story, you know that I was a child when I was experiencing insidious satanic abuse. I don't even go into all of the abuse that we experienced in my father's home because I shared just enough for you to be able to, be able to demonstrate what happened, how that spirit of fear ended up getting into me and wreaking havoc on my life. And you need to understand that science is not part of the solution. Science is a huge part of the problem. Science is the means by which we have become deceived. That is the means that Satan has used in order to cause us to defer to a false God, to false information, to establish a new gospel on this earth, a worldly gospel, and to abdicate control over the very things that God said, you have responsibility for this. You have responsibility that when I send something, you need to resolve it with me. You need to bring your grievances to me. I will hold those people accountable. You need to bring it to me and you need to resolve it with me. Now, I've spoken with you in other videos and in Heart Known series and a soul aligned about three areas where the devil is able to get in, three chinks in our armor. And it's not that the devil is just able to come and like slither in without our permission, without, even if we don't know, even if we lack understanding, because God says, if we sin ignorant, if we sin with knowledge, we're going to get a big lashing. If we sin ignorantly, we'll get a small lashing. The reason for that is if you do something wrong, God needs to give you consequences so you don't do it again. He's disciplining you. When my daughter was um, a toddler and she was teething, she sunk her teeth into her grandmother and her grandmother bit her back. And I was honestly so mad at her, but she didn't bite her hard. She bit her enough to show her what it felt like so that she understood you don't do that. This generation, I don't know what is going on in this world that everyone just coddles their kids and does not allow them to experience logical consequences for behavior. We have a terrible generation coming in and it just keeps getting worse because no one thinks that they should experience any consequences and they impose that on their God. They think that God doesn't give them consequences, but they are not reading that from the Bible. They are reading that from the delusions of their own mind. God gives us consequences. So the three chinks in the armor, lukewarm, unoccupied, unresolved. We're going to go through the first two because those are the fastest. Unoccupied simply means that we need to be occupied by the Holy Spirit. And the only way to be occupied by the Holy Spirit is to be constantly relating with him and fanning into his flame. If you don't fan into the flame, the fire is going to go out. We need to be doing this on a daily basis. On a daily basis, receiving our daily bread, reading our scriptures, communicating with him, and listening to him. A lot of people forget that, listening to God. We don't need to be doing all the talking. He already knows what we need. And we know that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings deeper than we can even understand. The next chink in the armor is lukewarm. 
God says in Revelation 3, 14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, right? These are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And we see elsewhere in scripture that God says, you cannot be double-minded. You cannot be adulterous. You cannot be unfaithful to God with the world. You got to choose. Who are you going to serve? Because friendship with the world is enmity to Christ. We are making ourselves enemies to Christ when we choose these false gods in the world. When we place idols before him, doesn't matter what the idol is. Doesn't matter if it's an herb that you think is going to heal you, a massage, uh, any something natural that you're claiming that, well, God made it, so it's going to heal me. Baloney. God says he's your healer. He didn't say, take this herb and call me in the morning. He says, if you obey me, I won't put on you any of the diseases that I put on the Egyptians. I am the Lord, your healer. That's clear. It's direct. No other gods before me. I created you. I have absolutely have the ability to heal you. If you don't believe that, you just might be lukewarm. If you're not living into that, you just might be lukewarm and you need to take a look at it. Now, the last place is the topic of this video. It is unresolved suffering. That's all trauma is. Mental health tries to make it into something more than it actually is. It's unresolved suffering and they don't have a solution for it. So that's the reason it's become bigger than it actually is. God is sovereign over all the experiences that have happened in your life. God gave me the father he gave me. He knew exactly how he was going to build me through what I endured when I was growing up. And it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. I was a child. I was helpless. I was hopeless in and of myself. But I had a God at that time, even if I didn't know who he was, God has been with me every step of the way. He has known every single thing that I have gone through and he has known exactly how he was going to use it to build me. He has known exactly what he was going to teach me. He knew when he brought me to the brink of death, when he brought me to the wall, that I would listen. Finally, that I would listen. Because it's not that God didn't try to talk with me at different times about my idolatry, about my sin. But I heard him then, and I... He brought me to a place of willingness. He brought me to a place where he would then be able to use that motivation, that confidence in him to strip me of the world. He knew what it took. And I am not going to be looking back from eternity, boohooing about what I went through here and the life that I wish I would have had instead. God has known exactly what was needed. So here's the thing, is I was a child and I did not have the ability to protect myself. I did not have the ability to understand that my father was using me for himself and manipulating me and telling me that it was for my own good when it was really about him. But God will deal, deal with those who have dealt with us. And my only job is to believe and trust in God's sovereignty that he knows what is good and to sort through the pain of what I went through. That is my responsibility because I can't be built if I'm stuffing that down. I can't be built if I refuse to let that see the light of day and I just go off and try to make another family when I become of age, right? I become of age and then go try to make another family so I can forget what I experienced. It doesn't work that way. We see what happens when people do that. They act it out on their own kids. It doesn't go anywhere. And I'm going to tell you why. Because God sent those things to build you. He's either sovereign or he's not. You got to decide. You got to decide if you actually believe that he is God. Because if he's not sovereign over your suffering, he is by, by definition not God. He is by definition not the one that he says he is in this word. If you return to him, he will heal you. 
He will minister to you. But here's the thing. Science is part of the problem. That false gospel that you have ingested in the world is part of the problem. These people of the world, even those who call themselves Christian, who are wise in their own eyes and try to come up with their own ideas about how to do things as a side truth from God, have no understanding, they have no wisdom about why it is, what it is that we're doing here and what it is that we need to pick up. And what it is that God is doing in us. We're not here for our comfort. We are not here to get comfortable in this world. We are not here to belong. We are not here for any of the baloney that mental health keeps telling us our life is about. Keeps telling us are the goals. Those are not the goals. If you feel grief, it's not major depression. It's not PTSD. You feel grief because God gave you the capacity to feel grief. There's something he wants to talk with you about. There's something he wants to build in you. You need to be able to have a way of receiving God's ministry and understanding your design. You need to be able to understand what that grief is and why it is that God gave you the ability to feel that feeling. If you feel anger, You need to be able to process that with him. You need to be able to bring your grievances to him and you need to be able to come to a place of resolution and confidence in your God that he will vindicate you, that he will give you justice, but that you do not get justice for yourself. Your job is to work on your heart. Your job is to forgive and to develop that capacity to process and soothe in order to receive God's ministry. You have to be able to process that stuff or it is going to rot you and the devil is going to have the ability to affect you, to slither in. Why? Because you're going to carry around resentment that you're supposed to be resolving. You're going to carry around, you're going to be denying the ministry of God, the purpose for which he set you apart, for which he redeemed you, for which he has every right to use you. So if you're refusing to be built because you keep stuffing that down or you keep distracting yourself with something else and you don't understand your design or you go to one of these false gods in this false gospel discipline, well, all right then. God said, return to me, but you're choosing something else. And remember that even if you don't know any better, you're still going to receive a lashing. Why? Because he's teaching you he's the one. He's the one you need to return to. I gave an example in a soul aligned and also in, you know, the reading that I did on the channel of my story. And this is not an like a an example that's not typical of especially women who have issues with their fathers who experienced abuse, who experienced not being protected and cared for, they look for that in a partner and they begin to idolize men. When we're not resolving our issues, these are the things that we're going to do. Our issues are going to lead to sin. Doesn't matter if it happened when we were a kid. I understand that might seem unfair to you, but you got to take that up with God. You have to resolve that with him. And we got so many people going around saying, I'm atheist and agnostic because God's not fair. God wouldn't do these things. Because they don't want to conform their heart to who God is. They're requiring God to conform him, himself, his heart to who they are. God knows what is do- what he's doing and he is the only good. We need not condemn him in order to justify ourselves. He's teaching us and he knows what is good. We either trust that or we don't. And if we're having trouble with it, he will help us to trust it if we ask him, please change my heart. And then we receive his ministry. He will. He will teach you as only he knows how, as only he can do with his creation. So why do people who have trauma have so many other mental health, so-called mental health and physical issues? Well, we know that when someone has been traumatized, for example, that their focus begins to go external. 
They're not able to stay inside of themselves. Now think about when you feel fear, if someone cuts you off on the road, where does your focus go? Are you able to just immediately go inside of yourself and go, Carrie Ann, it's okay, you're all right, this and that? No, you're ticked off at that person. Your focus is external. You become vigilant to the external world. You have to actively learn how to have that internal relationship where you're talking yourself through it, especially for those who have had childhood abuse, who have experienced childhood abuse, that didn't develop properly. That was your design. Your parents were supposed to have been good enough to where you were able to develop that. But due to the increase in wickedness, that's the state of our world. No one's really doing that. They just blame everybody else for their problems and lash out. So this is not about blaming your parents, but you do need to feel the pain of what you didn't receive when you were growing up. And you need to understand that no one, not a partner, not a best friend, and not even the parents who maybe didn't do the best job, no one can fix that for you because that developmental period has passed. That is your responsibility to do in personal relationship, in personal accountability. So now when something like that happens, you have a startling, scary event experience, your focus goes outward. Now with children who are experiencing this in an abusive home, they never really get to go inside of themselves. They never really get to resolve because they're always focused on the outside. They're always vigilant. We call that in the Bible being focused in the flesh. And woe to anyone, any adult who causes a child to sin, right? It would be better for a millstone to be hung around their neck and for them to be thrown in the depths of the sea than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So you have a child living in the flesh, freaked out. Their autonomic arousal is always up. What did we hear about that? When that happens on a chronic level, when that continues, your parasympathetic nervous system is not able to bring it down over time. But I want you to understand, if that's your case right now, that the one who created you is the only one who can heal you. It's not a problem for him. Just like I told you, my cortisol levels were shooting through the roof and dipping down. My creator is the only one who can heal me, and he did. I do not have panic attacks, what the world calls panic attacks. I don't have anything like that anymore. And I haven't since the father drew me to the son. I haven't since I started receiving his ministry, and he drove that spirit out of me, and he replaced that spirit with his Holy Spirit of peace. But here's my responsibility. I have to fan into the flame of that spirit, don't I? Every single day, I have to fan into the flame of that spirit or I will not be occupied. I have to choose single-mindedly that I'm going to serve Christ or I will become lukewarm. And should that happen, should I fall, that spirit will come back and find my house swept clean, put in order and unoccupied and bring with it seven more spirits, more wicked than itself, and my condition will be worse than it ever was. And God says, so it will be with this wicked generation. That is the condition we're dealing with. That is what you need to understand about how these spirits get in to begin with. So what are the spirits that I was handed over to? I was handed over to a spirit of fear because that's where I remained. I remained in my flesh trying to control people, places, and things because I felt terror all the time because there was no healing in any of the places that I was looking for healing, not in churches, not in medication, not in medicine or mental health. There was no healing for God's people. Why? Because the only place there is healing for God's people is in the one who created them. He is our counselor, our only counselor. There is no other counselor in the Bible, no human counselor. The Holy Spirit is our counselor. He's the only one who knows his creation. He's the only one who knows exactly how he created us, for what he created us, and exactly what's going to be needed in order to give that personalized healing. And you know, mental health, when I was going to graduate school, they used to always talk about 
whole person health, treating the whole person and giving a personalized approach, a person specific approach. No human being can do that. That is the job of the, the creator. That is the only job that can be fulfilled by the creator. Why would we go anywhere else? I mean, now that I know this, why would we go anywhere else? And now that I know this, I want you to know it. I want you to know that you don't have to bang your head against medicine, science, mental health, or anywhere else for that matter. You do not have to live like that. I was healed. I have watched dozens of people be healed and not have to take medications and not ha have to go through therapy or 12 steps or anywhere else. God has placed shepherds over his people. That's what he has done. A shepherd is all good. That's all I can do. I can shepherd you back to the word of God, back to the truth, back to his Holy Spirit. I can talk with you just as I'm talking with you right now and telling you the truth that is in his word and what his spirit will do for you, what he promises his people. I can listen to your story and I can tell you what the word says, what my experience has been. I can share my testimony as a witness, but I cannot heal you. I cannot counsel you. Only God does that. And he does it by convicting you and he does it by ministering to you. So you got to learn how to do that. And that's what I can help you with. That's what the books can help you with. But understand that you got to sort through your own issue. If you have issues where you want, no, I want a person who's sitting in front of me. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'm contacted by people who don't like the fact that I do things on, you know, if I am doing a workshop online, no, I want to be able to see you. Why? Why does a person need to see me? It's not about me. It's about the information. But people have been so brainwashed. And one of the things that I was taught when I was going to school was that human interaction is so important. And part of the reason that interaction is so important is because it's the therapeutic relationship that is healing the patient. Baloney. That's not how God designed us. He didn't design us to heal in relationship with man. He designed us to heal in relationship with him. Then we can be a whole person and we can have a healthy relationship with man. The only time that you needed to grow within, in that way in a relationship was when you were a child with your parent. That time has come and gone. That is no longer developmentally sound. It's not developmentally sound. We know that the time has come and gone. We know that there are certain things that a person needs to be able to do within their, their personal relationship and relationship with God in order to heal. You don't take that therapist with you anywhere. anywhere. And there's not a single therapist I saw in over 20, I think really it was over 30 years that I was in therapy. None of those relationships helped me. None of those therapies helped me. And I tried different ones. You don't heal in relationship with man. Man is fallible. And part of the reason why I believe that we have fallible parents and why it's important for us to come to terms with that is so that we're able to see that they're fallible and transfer our reliance onto an infallible heavenly father. If we had perfect parents, we wouldn't feel much motivation to do that because our parents would be meeting all of our needs. And it's very problematic in mental health that they don't help you to reconcile that. This next generation of psychologists, what I hear is this incessant need for everyone else to meet their needs. An entitlement for other people to meet their needs. And I, that is something that I learned when I was going to therapy as well. And you can never find someone to meet your needs. You know why? Because people are too busy meeting their own needs. That's called personal responsibility. You're not responsible for anyone else's needs, but your own and anyone who's dependent on you. So in a healthy situation, you would have learned how to do that so that you could then bring yourself correctly to God. Personal accountability, self-soothing, processing, relief, and then you bring yourself to God so that you're not bringing yourself in your flesh. But we got a world full of people who bring themselves to God in their flesh, and then they wonder why they're not hearing from him. So to kind of recap and use my situation as an example, in the, the two things that, you know, the, the two areas that I talked about, and there was 
much more, believe me, much more of my sin. But we'll talk about the two areas of sin that resulted from my trauma. One, living in the flesh. I had to learn how to live in the heart and spirit. I had to learn what was important to God, and I had to learn my design, the design of my soul. It took me many years to learn that, by the way. I never learned that in mental health. That's for darn sure. I had to learn how to live in the very place where God put his spirit and where he communicates with my spirit because he is spirit. So my first sin, living in the flesh and succumbing to fear. God gives us a feeling of fear. When we don't return to him, he, gives a, he hands us over to a spirit of fear to break down our will, to break down our flesh. The second area of sin, idolatry of men. Was it my fault that I was a child and I didn't have a father who cherished me and protected me and even from himself, especially from himself? No, that was not my fault. And it was very sad. And I have to feel those feelings. I had to feel those feelings in order to resolve, in order to understand the reasons why God had me experience that so that he could build me. But for many years, I engaged in idolatry of men because I didn't know how to heal from it. And I want you to know that for many years when relationships would end, God would try to deal with me on it. He would tell me that I could not put anyone before him. But I did not have the ability to do that because I was also contending with a spirit of fear that would compel me. So I didn't have full understanding and God was continuing to build me in that situation. Why? For the very message that I'm sharing with you, because I don't hear anyone else talking about this and neither does anyone that I wor have ever worked with tells me the same thing. How come no one's talking about this? Why isn't anyone telling us this in church? Why is this not well understood? Well, let me ask you something. Have you sought healing in his word? Have you sought to understand the heart of God and how he designed you and what he established, what he said, this is what my people need to do when I start sending these things? So let's just understand where our responsibility is. I understand that many of us have not known. I understand that I didn't know for many years. But now that you know, you got to turn to him. Let him deal with you. Let him minister to you. And I want to tell you something else, that I know what a heap of garbage, trauma, unresolved suffering feels like. It feels so overwhelming. There is no possible way that we could even know where to start, right? God knows. He's the only one who knows. No human counselor knows. He is the only one who knows how to minister to you, exactly what it is that you need, personalized healing. He created you. He will heal you. If this is something that you're struggling with, if you are struggling with being able to hear God, knowing how to, what, you know, what is contained in the personal accountability piece, how to bring yourself correctly to God, that is what the books are about that I have written. Heart Known Series is going to help you walk you through activities, walk you through ways of doing this that are light. They're not things that, like, you know, for those of you who've been in therapy, it's like they're taking a chisel to your soul. God's burden is light and his yoke is easy. When he starts healing you, you are going to feel a feel you are going to feel peace. You are going to feel a little sleepy. I know that sounds weird, but what he's telling you is to rest in him. When you feel sleepy, don't start bringing yourself up on caffeine or sugar or anything else. Let yourself rest. Let your heart work through what it feels like to rest and to know that God is taking care of things, to trust him, to rely on him, because you have to work your heart into that. When you've been used to performing like a machine for the world or you've been used to 
having this spirit of fear, it's going to feel a little weird not to have it. So that's why I'm telling you, these are some things that you can expect that you're going to feel peace. You're going to feel sleepy. If you want to know more about how to heal in this way, how to resolve your suffering, I highly, highly recommend getting, if you're going to get one of the books, I recommend getting Heart Known series because that's going to get you right into the work and understanding how God has designed you. If that's something that you want to take a look at, go on the channel. There are two links. There's one for a soul aligned and there's one for heart known series. You can access a good portion of those books on those links on the Kindle option. And that way you can test them out and see what the Holy Spirit says about this. Is this the path for you? Is this something that he's testifying to? Thank you so much for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video.